move on to the next speaker, Rocco Morano. Rocco has been actively engaged in the management of waterfowl and their habitats in various capacities for nearly 20 years. He was involved <clears throat> in research to increase efficiency of Canadian duck banding operations from 2002 to 2004 as part of his master's degree program at SDSU. Rocco then primarily focused on wetland and grassland conservation and restoration projects through his positions as a pheasants forever farm bill biologist and later as a private lands habitat biologist with, uh, with the Game Fish and Parks. Beginning in late 2010, Rocco took over as senior waterfowl biologist for the Game Fish and Parks, where he continues work on all aspects of migratory bird management and serves as South Dakota's technical representative for both the Central Flyway Technical Committee and the Prairie Pothole Joint Venture. Welcome, Rocco, and you have the floor. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, this, this next topic will dovetail a little bit into some of the things that, that Chris was just talking about with, her, with our three efforts. Um, you know, there's been a well-documented decline in, in many different hunting uh, cohorts and, and waterfall hunting is, is no exception. Um, many places actually waterfall hunting is declining at a more rapid pace than, than other hunting pursuits. And one way that um, the Central Flyway is, is trying to look at trying to not only uh, recruit, retain and, and uh, reactivate current hunters, but also try to get um, even some, some non-currently non waterfall hunters out there uh, to try to to try to increase support for for wetland and waterfall conservation and and uh, get some more folks out. So first, I'd like to to uh, acknowledge my co-authors on this and uh, Mark Vertiska and Chris Chisninski and Matt Grunterad from University of Nebraska Lincoln are helping collaborate on uh, primarily a lot of the human dimensions work. Mark Vertiska until very recently was the state waterfall biologist for Nebraska. He switched roles, but is still be very going to be integral in this uh, process in the project. And um, Jacob Bashaw was recently actually hired on um, as a two-tier coordinating biologist to help to run all the logistics of this experiment and make sure this is successful. Oh, I suppose better start the. There we go. So, why are waterfall hunters important? You know, and and. Most folks in this room probably understand this, but you know, with the North American model of wildlife management, you know, the the reason we have habitats and, and wildlife are because there are people out there that care about them, and, and most of those folks historically have been hunters. Uh, you know, it's a it's a major source of funding, not only through license sales, but through excise taxes on uh, ammo and and firearms and other equipment. This allows for, for conservation of habitat to support the birds. You know, I always think we, we don't need 40 or 50 million ducks running around North America if there is nobody to care about them. So and the only way that we're gonna have a long-term um, pool of funds for habitat conservation uh, for really any wildlife, but in particular waterfall and, and uh, wetland dependent birds are, is if there's waterfall hunters out there to support them. And it all also boils down to social and political support. You know, nothing is done in the United States without strong political support and things like the farm bill, what gets put in the farm bill. You look at the picture there on the left, that's an extremely bipartisan group of folks that support waterfall conservation in this, in this country. And you don't see that very much right now, um, but th that is still a, an area where we have really good political support. And that's because there's a lot of folks that care about waterfall and wetlands in this country. And we're trying to keep it that way. So this is just a graph of federal duck stamp sales, you know, really from the 30s all the way to the current period. And we, we saw a sharp decline um, beginning in the 1970s where, where sales peaked at just under two and a half million duck stamps. And, you know, part of that's demographic. You know, we had a, a large generation um, kind of starting to age out. Um, but in, in the past, as duck species, as duck populations ebbed and flowed, duck stamp sales went up and down. Well, what happened in the 90s is that when waterfall populations returned with, with the prairies getting wet, uh, duck stamp sales did not follow suit. And we, and we saw a, just kind of a stabilizing at a lower level um, for duck stamp sales. In the Central Flyway specifically, we lost about 50,000 duck hunters between 1999 and 2018. Uh, it's pretty significant, but if you look at 
Nebraska and South Dakota specifically, we lost an even higher percentage. Um, you know, between 1999 and, and 2019, we lost half our duck hunters. It's an attrition rate of about two and a half percent annually, or roughly 500 duck hunters per state per year, uh, which is, is significant. And, you know, you, you, you lose that, that heritage and, and, the, and the interest in the state, and it's hard to get that back. And what we're trying to do with this regulation ex experiment is see if we can remove some barriers um, to participation in, in waterfall hunting and duck hunting is specifically. So as I mentioned there, you know, it's, it's widely known that, that there's, there's ramifications for declining in, in hunters in general, but for waterfall hunters and duck stamp sales, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to figure out what those ramifications are. So based on, um, you know, projections, it, there was about 600,000 fewer duck stamps um, that were sold between 1995 and 2008 based on prior sales and what should have happened when the ducks returned um, after the, the droughts of the 80s. And that translates to about $126 million or between 42 and, and 80,000 hectares of wetland and grassland uh, habitat that is not protected because of that. So it's, it's real, it's real uh, impacts on the landscape. So how do you find out what are the barriers to participation of duck hunting? What we did is we asked people. And over the last several years, there's been several uh, human dimensions projects that we've cooperated with. I've been, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln with Dr. Chesinski, and we've had a, uh, a barriers paper and a motivations paper that recently came out uh, with Matt Heinrichs's uh, graduate work that really dove into this. This is a really busy slide and I apologize, but I'm gonna try to walk through this a little bit. So we asked waterfall hunters and non-waterfall hunters um, and based on uh, avidity or the avidness of, of, of the waterfall hunters, um, what are the barriers to, to hunting? And if you look at um, that orange line there, you see identification as you would expect for an avid hunter isn't a really big deal. You know, zero is not limiting, four is very limiting. But as you go up the scale to disassociate and sporadic, you see a little bump. But then if you go to non-waterfall hunters, but they're, they're conservationists, they're anglers or begging hunters or small game hunters, that, that increases. And that's kind of our target audience with this experiment, seeing if we can um, get some of the, the conservation-minded folks that currently do not duck hunt participating. And if you look closely, let, let's say the combo user, which is a person that does one or more uh, outdoor activities like fishes and hunts or fishes and, and small game hunts or big game hunts. Um, that 1.48 is on par with things like cost, hunting skills, uh, travel. So it is a significant barrier to some of these folks. Um, so what we're trying to do is reduce barriers in places where we can. And what's really important when you look at those barriers is the amount of control that as an agency we have. Uh, and also the cost associated with that. You look at something like rules and regulations and waterfowl identification, we certainly have control over that. We can, we can change that. Uh, the agency cost is relatively low. You know, it's, it's, it's not like you're going out and buying property. The scale of application is extremely large. Uh, you potentially can, can impact the entire hunting population. When you look at something like land access, yes, we have control over it to a point, um, the cost is extremely high and the scale application is medium. Uh, look at something like waterfall hunting skills, teaching people how to hunt, certainly have control over it. Agency cost is low, but the scale of application is low. It's kind of one person at a time, you know, teaching one person at a time ID skills or how to set decoys or how to call. It's all really important things and we, and we're, and we try to do uh, kind of a multi-pronged approach. But if you can do something at a very large scale at a low cost, I think it's worth a try. So the, the goal of, the, as you go out right now, you have, you have a six duck limit, you know, may not include more than five mallards. And then there's all these other species and sex restrictions. And, you know, while a lot of people do know their ducks and especially if they're in plumage, you know, if, they don't always look like this. And that, and that is an issue. This is, you know, some of those same species. 
um, as they probably look um, more at, up in this end of the flyway. Uh, you know, you have a lot of female ducks. You have a lot of duck of drake ducks that are not in full plumage yet in September and October, and it's a it's difficult. It's, it's intimidating for people. I talk to people all the time that that uh, you know have this as a as a fear going on duck hunting. I always say to myself, you know, in any other outdoor pursuit or hobby or sport, who would go out and try something? If the, if the first time you had to go out, you had to be relatively proficient. And if you weren't, there was a chance you got a ticket. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of exactly that situation folks put, are put in. So we're trying to look at what happens if we take out the species restriction and uh, identification uh, in flight requirement for duck hunting. And we also have to look at risk versus reward. You know, as part of the run up to this experiment, we had to demonstrate that there would not be a undue uh, biological impact on any species that has a, a species specific restriction. So what we did as we went to the parts collection survey data and mined that data to see basically as a worst case scenario per unit of, of recruits that use this system, how many more pintail, canvasback and, and hen mallards would potentially be harvested. And if you look at South Dakota data on the top there, you can see that for pintails, you get to, to a two bird bag and only 2% of the bags contained uh, two pintails. So if you extrapolate that out per 500, 1,000 and 2,500 additional hunters in South Dakota, that extrapolates out to 24 extra pintails and 61 extra pintails for, and, and 12 at 500. So the biological ramifications for this for these three species are very small. And I, I, I always say I would take this, I would take that every day of the week if I could show an increase in recruitment or retention or reactivation of duck hunters in, in South Dakota, Nebraska. Um, and really with little to no um, impact on populations. So as part of the motivations and barriers research, we tried to figure out some of the anticipated participation by act by waterfall hunters that currently um, do hunt. So we asked folks, you know, if you had this option, would you participate? You know, how would your participation be affected? And for AVIDs, you'd expect, you know, there's not a lot of folks that are AVIDs that probably would do this, but 13% said that it would increase. Um, decrease, okay, but they're still going to buy a license if they're AVIDs. But, but the, the thing is, you know, a lot of people don't understand that it is an option and not a requirement. So that's something that our messaging is trying to get out. Um, you know, with disassociated hunters on the other end of the spectrum, 28% say it would increase when only 7% decrease. So um, there is a signal that there would be some participation from, from uh, current waterfall hunters. And then from non-waterfall hunters, you can see the increase uh, indicated increase is, is higher. Um, you know, the combo user is the folks that go out and do several things. That's almost a third, say they would increase their participation. And small game hunters is the same. So like, again, there is a, there is a signal that it, it potentially will increase participation in some of those other user groups. So complex versus simple regulations. Regulations can be difficult to, go to, to negotiate. Some people can handle it, others can't. Simpler regulations by nature equal a loss of hunting opportunity. Right now with our species specific regulations, we're basically trying to squeeze the last duck out of every stock that we can. That's why there's pintail limits and redhead limits and wood duck limits and, and things like that. Um, it's trying to basically manage at a level that the, each population can sustain, um, but that by necessity makes regulations more complicated. They don't encourage participation for sure. If, if a folks are out there trying to learn these things um, in advance, um, it's really hard to do that not, while not actually being out in the marsh and being able to try it out. So there's divergent objectives. We wanna to try to increase participation, but we don't want folks that can handle the regulations that as they currently exist, we don't want them to be um, denied the harvest opportunities that are available. So we came up with the two-tiered duck hunting regulations experiment to try to uh, take advantage of both of those 
um, paradigms. So what is it? It's basically a structure of duck hunting regulations where you can choose at the beginning of the season whether you would be in tier one or tier two. Tier one is exactly how it is now. Six ducks a day with all the uh, species and sex restrictions. Tier two allows you to shoot three ducks a day with no species or sex restrictions. Um, it, uh, so you can shoot any three ducks. It does not matter. Luckily, the Fish and Wildlife Service has allowed Nebraska and South Dakota to evaluate this as a four-year experiment. And we're going to begin this fall. Um, we're going to be using the current harvest inf information program to help evaluate the program or the experiment. And why are we using the HIP? We're using the HIP because it's, uh, it's, it's already in, in, uh, in use. It's also going to help out uh, strengthen and enforcement of obtaining a HIP number and hopefully uh, uh, participation in HIP. And already connects, it's already connected to the harvest information program and we can use that that estimate to do a direct comparison between the tier one and tier two folks. So the objectives of the experiment are to maintain and increase conservation support, um, help assure that waterfowl hunting heritage continues in, in the central flyway, and also maintain uh, populations of current, duck, of current duck stocks that have species specific regulations. Um, hopefully at the end, we increase funding for waterfowl management and minimize um, overhead because it doesn't make any sense to do this if it's gonna cost more than it, than it brings in. So what have we done so far? Uh, we've already started a, a pretty broad communications campaign. Um, we're working with various organizations to build support and uh, awareness. Um, we're we're gonna have a series of podcasts with different organizations. We're gonna have a social media campaign. Um, news releases are ready to go. We just need to wait for the, our final commission action in both Nebraska and South Dakota, and places like this where, you know, where we are trying to increase awareness uh, with various uh, publics. We're also trying to merge this effort with current R3 programs, including the Collegiate First Hunt, which you heard uh, Chris talk about. We're trying to try to get this, this uh, communicated with those folks in those programs. We're going to incorporate to our hunter safety program in each state, and we're also going to uh, incorporated into the state R3 education outreach programs. Rocco, sorry, you have two minutes. Okay, so how are we gonna evaluate this? We're gonna have pre and post, uh, pre and post surveys to try to um, get opinions and attitudes for both hunters and participants of the two-tier program. We've already done a pre-survey, which I'm not gonna go into. Um, and then we're gonna track participation and you, kind of uniquely, we're gonna use mark recapture techniques to track survival of duck hunters basically, and use each time they buy a license as a recapture. So uh, Graham in 2019 uh, did this and found that in Nebraska, South Dakota, we had uh, Lambda rates that were below one, which is not what you wanna see. So we're gonna see if we can turn that around and get Lambda back above one. We're also gonna do a, a mini wing bee. We're gonna have folks that do, that do participate in the tier two to provide wings and diary data, just like they do for the parts collection survey uh, that happens now. Those wings will be actually incorporated into the wing bee and uh, sorted with, this, with those wings at the same time. That way we'll be able to compare apples and apples. Is a tier two duck hunter having an undue impact on uh, waterfall populations of any species? Then other questions are frequently asked. Is there a graduation requirement during the experiment? No, you can stay in tier two the entire four years if you want to. Um, and hunters will register when you apply for HIP. So that's when you're, you're gonna register for this and you'll be bound to it for the duration of, the, of that year. You can't flip flop um, once you choose a, a tier. It'll only be used under the liberal and moderate seasons um, as determined by AHM. So if all of a sudden we go into restrictive package, the two tier experiment goes away. It does not apply to early goose because geese aren't part of this. Bonus bluing teal are not included. And uh, teal seasons in Nebraska are not part of this either. So next steps, continue communication, outreach, and education. Uh, prepare logistical uh, hurdles like trying to get uh, wings and, and diaries out to the hunters um, and figure out how we get into the parts collection and then continue outreach with partners and managers. 
And at the end of this, what we're hoping for is a lot of smiles and, and first duck hunts like my daughter here from this year. So questions. Um, actually, we're at time. So Rocco, I'm going to have them just chat you with any questions that they might have, if that's all right. You bet. Okay, thank you.